You good? Go ahead. How we all doing? Uh, welcome back from the holidays. Uh, first time live in what, three weeks, I think? Um, yeah, as Kenny mentioned, he's changed the studio around a little bit, got some new backgrounds, got some new equipment. Um, there's only two of us today, so we're gonna do the best we can. Apparently our third party, I'm not going to mention any names, Gary Cleveland, decided that he was going to go to Hawaii instead of being here with us doing uh, live training Tuesday. <laughs> so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about LTE, loss of tail rotor effectiveness. Um, that's the more common name, I guess. Uh, technically it's called unanticipated y'all. So with that said, you want to roll your video? Yep, we'll roll it now. Loss of tail rotor effectiveness, LTE. What is it? The helicopter flying handbook tells us loss of tail rotor effectiveness, LTE, or an unanticipated yaw is defined as an uncommanded rapid yaw towards the advancing blade, which does not subside of its own accord. It can result in the loss of the aircraft if left unchecked. It is very important for pilots to understand that LTE is caused by an aerodynamic interaction between the main rotor and tail rotor and not caused from a mechanical failure. Some helicopter types are more likely to encounter LTE due to the normal certification thrust produced by having a tail rotor that, although meeting certification standards, is not always able to produce the additional thrust demanded by the pilot. So first let's cover the three winds that you have to be familiar with so that you don't get yourself in an LTE situation. First we'll talk about main rotor disc interference. If you have a wind off the quartering left front degrees 285 to 315 degrees, and winds at velocities of 10 to 30 knots from the left front cause the main rotor vortex to be blown into the tail rotor by the relative wind. This main rotor disc vortex causes the tail rotor to operate in an extremely turbulent environment. So try to visualize a great big huge donut of air around the outside of that rotor system, turbulent air being recirculated, and that wind coming on that angle is pushing all that dirty, turbulent air into that tail rotor. The second is weathercock stability. Winds from 120 degrees to 240. In this region, the helicopter attempts to weather vane or weathercock its nose into the relative wind. Unless a resisting pedal input is made, the helicopter starts a slow, uncommanded turn either to the right or left depending upon the wind direction. If the pilot allows a right yaw to develop and the tail of the helicopter moves into this region, the yaw rate can accelerate rapidly. In order to avoid the onset of LTE in this downwind condition, it is imperative to maintain positive control of the yaw rate and devote full attention to flying the helicopter. The third one you need to be aware of is tail rotor vortex ring state. These are winds from 210 to 330 degrees. Winds within this region cause the tail rotor vortex ring state to develop. The result is a non-uniform, unsteady flow into the tail rotor. The vortex ring state causes tail rotor thrust variations which will result in yaw deviations. Rapid and continuous pedal movements are necessary to compensate for the rapid changes in tail rotor thrust when hovering in a left crosswind. Maintaining a precise heading in this region is difficult, but this characteristic presents no significant problem unless corrective action is delayed. However, high pedal workload, lack of concentration, and over-controlling can lead to LTE. So again, those three are main rotor disc interference, 285 to 315, weathercock stability, 120 to 240 degrees, and tail rotor vortex ring state 210 to 330. So there are a number of contributing factors to this LTE that you need to be aware of. Number one, low and slow flight outside of ground effect. Number two, winds from plus or minus 15 degrees of the 10 o'clock position and possibly around the five o'clock position. Number three, tail winds that may alter the onset of translational lift and translational thrust that induce high power demands and demand more anti-torg left pedal than the tail rotor can produce. Number four, low speed downwind turns. Number five, large changes of power at low air speeds. Number six, low speed flight in the proximity of physical obstructions that may alter a smooth airflow to both the main rotor and tail rotor. You need to be aware of LTE at altitude. And we know anytime we have high gross weight, high density altitude, that always is a contributing factor to anything bad that goes on in the helicopter. So of course, at higher density altitudes, higher altitudes, you're gonna be more susceptible to LTE. So there are some steps for reducing the onset of LTE. And these steps are one, 
maintain maximum power on rotor RPM, even if the main rotor RPM is allowed to decrease, the anti-torque thrust available is decreased proportionally. Number two, avoid tailwinds below air speeds of 30 knots. If loss of translation lift occurs, it results in an increased power demand and additional anti-torque pressures. Avoid OGE operations and high power demand situations below air speeds of 30 knots at low altitudes. Number four, be especially aware of wind direction and velocity when hovering in winds of about 8 to 12 knots. A loss of translational lift results in an unexpected high power demand and an increased anti-torque requirement. Number five, be alert to changing wind conditions which may be experienced when flying along ridge lines and around buildings. Be aware that if a considerable amount of left pedal is being maintained, a sufficient amount of left pedal may not be available to counteract an unanticipated right yaw. And number seven, execute slow turns to the right, which would limit the effects of rotating inertia and the loading on the tail rotor to control yawing would be decreased. So the best thing to do is avoid these situations and not even get yourself into it. But let's say you did, for whatever reason, you got yourself into a LTE situation, then you need to know the recovery technique. If a sudden, unanticipated rut yaw occurs, you need to apply forward cyclic control to increase speed. If altitude permits, reduce power. As recovery is affected, adjust controls for normal forward flight. A recovery path must always be planned, especially when terminating to an OGE hover and execute immediately if an uncommitted right yaw is evident. Collective pitch reduction aids in arresting the yaw rate but may cause an excessive rate of descent. Any large rapid increase in collective to prevent ground or obstacle contact may further increase the yaw rate and decrease rotor RPM. The decision to reduce collective must be based on the pilot's assessment of the altitude available for recovery. If the rotation cannot be stopped and ground contact is imminent, an auto-rotation may be the best course of action. Maintain full left pedal until the rotation stops, then adjust to maintain heading. So you can dig into the helicopter flying book a little deeper if you want to go even deeper than that. And for more information on LTE, you can go to Advisory Circular AC90-95, Unanticipated Right Yaw in Helicopters. So my thing, avoid those winds, know how to reduce the onset, Use good pilot technique and make sure you understand the recovery technique in the event you got into it. One, two, three. All right, forgive us. We're operating three stations with two people. And why is that <laughs> again? We're operating three stations with two people. Uh, why is that again? I'm not quite sure why that is. Because <clears throat> we're missing somebody. Oh, yeah, that's right. Hawaii, Australia. Jeez. Yeah. What are you paying him? Obviously, My Lord. obviously too much. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to jump in here and man the station over here. Another new background. I don't think you heard me in the beginning because we've revamped everything over the Christmas break. So long story short, we've had some gear, <laughs> rewired everything. So, hey, uh, stand by and, and give us a, uh, a break. That's why you didn't hear me. But I think I got that fixed. So I'm going to go ahead and mention everybody before I go back over to Chris. And Chris is going to cover some stuff with you. So we got Greg Atkinson, all right, he's here. Sam Dottery, Paul G, Kevin McCombs, Rero, T. Gregory Berry, Mark Schmidt. No sound, that was from earlier. Hopefully the sound's going now. Paul B. Sound, yep. David, Chris Anderson, awesome. Sam Dottery, Brian Bay, Mark Schmidt. Taz Christman, there he is. Paul G, Jessica, cheers from Colorado. Max Flight Helicopter, Happy New Year from everyone at Max Flight Helicopters. Awesome. So, hopefully you guys can hear us now. So, stand by while I run over and swing the camera around to Chris. He's got a couple of different things he's going to go over with you. Get Chris up and ready. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. That looks nice. I like that. Outstanding. I don't know. You didn't like the... Just the belly shot there. Oh, it was there. all right. It was yeah. all right. I've been working out. If you can't tell, I don't know. All right. Again, uh, you saw a video that uh, Kenny produced a couple years ago on uh, loss of tail rotor effectiveness. Um, we were kind of watching it in here. It looks like a pretty good video. Uh, I'm sure I watched it uh, back when he first produced it, but uh, we're probably gonna just go over exactly what um, what he talked about. There's, uh, like as we were talking about earlier, there's no reason to, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. This is a pretty, uh, 
uh, easy concept to understand and there's nothing new since it was first developed so uh, we're just going to kind of go in depth over it. Uh, a couple of my notes that I've made as, a, as an instructor just to talk to you about. Uh, technically it's unanticipated y'all but we commonly call it, uh, call it uh, LTE, loss of tail rotor effectiveness. That's what everybody else calls it. Um, if you want uh, a very detailed reading about it, you can uh, look at AC 90-95. Uh, a simple thing to remember is a, a note that I wrote down was tail rotor not producing adequate thrust to maintain directional control. It will not correct on its own. And if it is not corrected, you have a, a high risk of losing the aircraft. Uh, important note that we're covering, this is loss of tail rotor effectiveness. This does not have anything to do with um, a mechanical issue. This is a uh, aerodynamic issue from winds or certain azimuths or, or whatever. Um, this is not talking about if your tail rotor transmission seizes or if your tail rotor breaks or even if you have a, a stuck pedal, okay? Those are, those are three different uh, issues that we can cover on a, on a different broadcast. Um, also to note, on a single rotor helicopter, so m mainly every aircraft that we're probably gonna fly or, and all training helicopters, it will rotate to the right in a counterclockwise system with air speeds less than 30 knots. So, loss of tail rotor effectiveness in a single rotor aircraft with a counterclockwise system, you're gonna to rotate to the right with air speeds less than, than 30 knots. Um, this is something that I teach my students and it's um, a, a simple little reminder or an aid, a memory aid for you that uh, Kenny taught me when we first started. Uh, unfortunately, as time goes on and we get younger and younger students, they're not gonna remember this, but if everybody remembers the movie E.T., do we, everybody know what I'm talking about, E.T.? <laughs> Here's how I remember it, E.T., okay? Engine, tail rotor. If you lose your engine, your nose is gonna go to the left. If you lose your tail rotor, your nose is gonna go to the right. Okay, so E.T. It is funny, I did talk to, I taught that to a kid and he looked at me like I was crazy. He had no idea, the movie E.T., had no idea. All right, so are you ready to follow me with the camera? Absolutely. I am ready. We're gonna move over to my right, your left. And this is gonna be a small little presentation that uh, I'll have to be honest with you, I did not write on here. I'm not quite sure who did. Is this uh, Kenny's? Handwriting, maybe? I'm guilty. Nice. So I'm going to cheat a little bit, and we're just going to read off of uh, Kenny's notes here. So again, LTE, loss of tail rotor effectiveness, also known as unanticipated y'all. Advisory Circular 90-95. References are the Helicopter Flying Handbook. Uh, it's an uncommanded rapid y'all towards the advancing blade. Okay, so counterclockwise aircraft, advancing blade is on the right. So as I mentioned earlier, nose goes to the right. Okay, very important. Uh, this can result in the loss of the aircraft if left uncorrected. Okay, so as we're gonna dig in here, you're gonna loss of tail rotor effectiveness. We we're gonna spin to the right. If you do not correct that, there is a high probability that you're gonna lose the aircraft and more importantly, you're gonna be injured or even lose your life. All right, so in LTE, when hovering or with air speeds less than uh, ETL, there are three wind azimuths that you must know. Um, now, as I teach my students, there really isn't, uh, I don't think, if you really want to um, impress your examiner, you can get the exact degrees and tell him or even the name of each one. But the main three, and I'll just tell you real quick, is a left quartering headwind a direct crosswind and a tailwind, okay? So the first one we're gonna talk about, main rotor disc interference, okay? That is your left quartering headwind and the degrees are 285 to 315. So if you're sitting in the aircraft, it's gonna be your left quartering headwind. 285 to 315, left quartering headwind. Winds that are 10 to 30 knots. What's occurring is winds are coming across your rotor disc 
the downwash or the vortices from your main rotor is being pushed into your tail rotor and it's not your tail rotor is not um, in clean air it's not uh, performing at 100 percent because of that dirty air that's being pushed into it so again this is called main rotor disc vortex interference left quartering headwind again if you want to impress your examiner on check right day you'll know the exact name and you'll know the degrees but more importantly no left quartering headwind number two Weathercock stability, basically weather vaning. Okay, that's the name of it, weathercock stability. The wind azimuth is 120 to 240, and this is your tailwind, okay? Know that if you're hovering around with, you know, uh, 10 to 30 knots of wind, or any type of wind, actually it's even lower than that, what's occurring is that the tail boom is trying to weather vane into the wind. So you're going to have a lot of um, a lot of back and forth on your pedals. You're going to have to be on top of your pe pedals as you're as you're hovering around. So again, this is weathercock stability. The aircraft's trying to weather vane into the wind, and your degrees is 120 to 240. The third one we're going to talk about is tail rotor vortex ring state. And what this is telling us is this is your left crosswind. It's from 210 to 310, okay? Your tail rotor thrust, remember this, this is, this is uh, something that our examiner that we use often has told us that a lot of people go in and not really knowing. Tail rotor thrust is toward the tail boom, okay? So on this one, what is occurring is the left crosswind is pushing the vortices from the tail rotor back into the tail rotor so again it's not um, producing 100 percent thrust there it's operating in dirty air disturbed air so again the left crosswind the wind is pushing the the tail rotor vortices back into the tail rotor itself and it's causing the tail rotor not to perform at 100 percent again this is called tail rotor vortex ring state it's from 210 to 310 but more importantly just know it's from a left crosswind the pilot workload is very high on this because you're, again, on top of your pedals, making sure that you're staying with that left crosswind and it's not pushing you around. Some contributing factors. Airflow and downdraft generated by the main rotor. The blade tip vortices turbulence and other phenomenon affecting airflow of the tail rotor, high power setting, slow forward airspeed, airflow relative to the, helic the helicopter, and any of these combinations thereof. So again, LTE is going to happen at less than ETL with, with uh, winds anywhere, I think the book says 8 knots to, to 12 knots. So if you're hovering around and you're having 15 knot winds that day on a training day, you, you're very likely to get into LT if you're not careful. You need to be aware of LT. And other contributing factors, like I said, let me grab a piece of paper. Uh, the wind azimuth is the one, gross weight, high gross weight, density altitude, low indicated airspeed, and then a power droop. If you get into it and all of a sudden you apply a lot of power, that's just gonna to aggravate the uh, the problem. Recovery technique. Apply forward cyclic to increase speed. Okay, so I just talked about if you got into LT, it's because you're at a slow airspeed. So to get out of it, if your surroundings are, if you're allowed to because of your surroundings, try to fly out of it. Increase your airspeed. You also want to Okay, Kenny mentions a recovery path must be always planned. Yep, avoid rapid collective increase. That's that what we're talking about. Auto rotation can be an option. So, to recover, full left pedal, increase airspeed. Okay, if you can fly out of it, try to fly out of it. If altitude is permitting, you may have to actually enter the auto to, to break that cycle. Some things that you can uh, do to reduce the onset of LTE. 
maintain high operating RPM, maintain that in the high green. Remember, your rotor RPM or your engine power is proportional to your, your tail rotor. So if you have low rotor RPM or if, you're high, or if you're operating in the low green, then that's just less authority for your tail rotor. Remember, they're, they're direct, directly proportional to each other. Avoid tailwinds below 30 knots of airspeed. That's just like you never see a helicopter take off with a tailwind. Avoid outer ground effect. Hover at high power below 30 knots. So, as I mentioned earlier, being out of ground effect, high gross weight, uh, with a tailwind, you know, you're just asking for trouble there. Be aware of the hovering winds at 8 to 12 knots. Be aware of large left pedal. Yeah, if you're already, if you're out there hovering and you've already got full left pedal to try to maintain directional control, you might have an issue there later on. Be alert to changing winds, meaning be alert to changing wind directions. And execute slow turns to the right. Think about it, if you're sitting there hovering, you already got a left crosswind and you're about ready to part and then you make your turn to the right, what just happened? Now your left crosswind became a tailwind and you're at slow speeds. Now what I try to, that's the end of our butcher block presentation. Bring that back over there. No, that's my first day running camera, right. so just yeah, it's all right. I had a thought, Kenny, and I lost my train of thought. Well, you want to roll the NTSB video? Give them yeah, a let's uh, let's what? roll the NTSB video. We got a five-minute video that we found. Looks like the NTSB just put out about uh, I think early April, um, talking about this. And there is a an actual NTSB um, employee who found himself in a LT situation, and he talks about that. All right, here we go. The NTSB has investigated several accidents involving a loss of tail rotor effectiveness, or unanticipated yaw. This phenomenon is a critical, low-speed aerodynamic flight characteristic that causes a rapid, uncommanded yaw that will not subside on its own. If the yaw rate is not corrected, the helicopter will continue to spin and a loss of control will occur that could result in serious injury or death. All single rotor helicopters are susceptible to this phenomenon and can occur in all modes of helicopter operations. Clint Johnson, Chief of the Alaska Regional Office of the NTSB, has a personal story regarding LTE that he'd like to share. Quite some time ago, about 20 years ago, I had an incident involving loss of tail rotor effectiveness that really changed my life. This accident, or near accident, involved a, a landing on a ridgeline that I lost tail rotor effectiveness. Circumstances were, uh, this I was supporting a, a repeater site around the anchorage area. My job that day was to go up to a 4,000 foot uh, repeater site on top of a mountain and initially I was scheduled to fly a 206 L3 which has a much more a higher gross weight allowance than a Jet Ranger. At the last moment the scheduling changed I was now assigned to a to a Jet Ranger and unfortunately that was probably one of our heavier Jet Rangers. This one was outfitted with pop-out floats. I still have the same load to take, the same technicians and their gear did a quick weight and balance, saw that I could do it legally and a below gross weight, but very close to the gross weight of the helicopter, the maximum gross weight. We departed. We were already a little bit behind because of the, the, the schedule change, so there was a, a fair amount of self-induced pressure. You're wanting to do a good job. You're wanting to be able to get up there and, and get these guys to their site on time. So I didn't take all the normal precautions when we were coming into the landing site. The landing site is a very barren, windswept uh, mountaintop where there are no trees, no grass, no nothing to give you a feel of where exactly that wind direction is coming from. I didn't take that time because I was already behind. Again, that self-induced pressure was creeping in. While I was on approach to the landing site, you always want to leave yourself an out, whereas if you are not able to, to safely make that approach, you could dive off one side or to, to the either to the left or the right of that landing site. 
I came in, set the, the torque at 100%, had the closure rate coming into the landing site, and uh, the closure rate kept creeping forward. I wasn't seeing a, uh, a slowdown in the, in the closure rate. At that point, um, torque stayed at 100%. We started falling through the approach and uh, looked at the low rotor RPM. At that point, uh, was had full left deflection as far as the, the, the pedal position. I started my uh, approach off to the, to the right side of the landing site and that's where basically everything started happening. I hit the stops on the left tail rotor pedal. This turn, the, the nose of the, air, of the machine continued to the right and at that point we made probably four or five revolutions around and it seemed like it was getting worse and worse and worse. Uh, luckily I was able to get away from the hill and start downhill and I was able to actually lower the collective which slowed the rotation down and then was able to get regain some airspeed uh, and then uh, again regain control of the machine but it was very very close. Uh, at the end of the day we probably made probably five or six revolutions. Don't really know exactly how many uh, the thing that really sticks in my mind is the, the, the noise of the machine, the transmission being drugged down and, and kind of the, what, what I would classify as the death throes just before the, the accident happened and luckily we were able to, to regain control and uh, promptly landed at the base of the mountain and checked the machine to see if it was okay but it was a very um, enlightening moment for me. It changed my life as far as uh, it taught me that nobody is immune. Um, you know, all those human factors lined up and almost caused an accident. According to the FAA Rotorcraft Flying Handbook, to prevent unanticipated yaw in helicopters, be aware of your surroundings and the wind direction at all times, especially in high workload areas when flying along ridge lines and around buildings and when hovering in winds of 8 to 12 knots. Avoid tailwinds below an airspeed of 30 knots. Avoid out of ground effect operations in high power demand situations below 30 knots. Maintain power on rotor RPM. Monitor the amount of left anti-torque pedal being used. If insufficient pedal is available, you may not be able to counteract an unanticipated yaw. Conduct a thorough pre-flight planning assessment and stay below the helicopter's maximum allowable gross weight. The best way to prevent an uncommanded yaw is to never let it happen in the first place. Stay alert and don't get caught off guard. And you're up. Back on. Yep. Want to try this TV again? <laughs> sure. Hey, whatever. All right, we're back. We're back. Hopefully uh, you enjoyed that video. Sorry about going, um, and we just lost that one again. <laughs> Uh, oh, sorry about right around here. Yeah, sorry about the how we went into there. Uh, we got uh, interrupted by someone who just walked in on us, and I <laughs> totally lost my train of thought. I guess. Right. And anyway, that's, and that's um, tough. The guy stood there. I'm like, oh, we're live, and then he yeah. just stands there watching Chris. Completely uh, throwing him off. Like I was on the spot. I guess I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, anyway, back to the NTSB video that you saw. Um, they gave you a brief explanation as we've already covered about it about LT, um, but what I thought was uh, neat or whatever, you know, there's an experienced NTSB um, investigator who himself got into a situation because of contributing factors. There, I mean, they talked about they changed his helicopter on him at the very end and my TV's going crazy. <laughs> and they talked about, you know, he was in a rush to make his landing. Well, you know, but there you go. There's, there's how we get into it. Um, upon doing that, or looking at his video, I just, I pulled up some things here. And I just want to read a few things to you. During a 10 year period from 2004 to 2014, the NTSB investigated 55 accidents involving LTE. Uh, I'm just going to read you uh, three synopsis here of the case studies. They were all counterclockwise rotor blade systems. A pilot was making an approach to a hospital helipad into light wind at night when he chose to go around. The pilot lowered the helicopter's nose, added power, and raised the collective. The, collect the helicopter then entered a rapid, violent right spin. The pilot applied left anti-torque pedal and cyclic but was unable to recover. The helicopter spun several times before impacting power lines and terrain. Just before the pilot added power to go around, the helicopter was traveling about five knots of ground speed. 
At such a low ground speed, the tail rotor is required to produce nearly 100% of directional control. The pilot likely did not adequately, adequately ugh, account for the helicopter's low airspeed when he applied power to go around, which resulted in a sudden uncommanded right yaw due to LTE. So there you go, there's a, a hospital helipad, so obviously he's a commercial rated pilot flying uh, EMS, and uh, he got himself into it. Second uh, one here is the pilot and two passengers were surveying deer with the helicopter about 50 to 100 feet above ground level with a five to 10 knot left crosswind and an indicated ground speed of 30 to 35 knots. As terrain began to rise, the pilot added power to clear a ridge. The pilot reported that when the helicopter was about 100 feet from the top of the ridge, the helicopter began to yaw to the right. He added power to clear the ridge line, which greatly increased the right yawing motion. The helicopter began spinning, crossed over the ridge line backward, and continued spinning before it contacted the ground and rolled over on its left side. A passenger reported that although the wind was about 10 knots when they started the survey, the wind speed increased when the helicopter reached the top of the ridge, and the pilot had to correct for it twice before the helicopter began spin spinning to the right. The helicopter was operating with the wind coming from the left and at a high power setting. The unanticipated right to yaw and subsequent spinning of the helicopter are consistent with LT. Number three, the pilot had planned a Part 91 sightseeing flight around New York City with two passengers. However, four passengers arrived for the flight. The pilot did not complete performance calculations before the accident flight and the helicopter was in, was in excess of maximum allowable gross weight at takeoff. Shortly after departure, while the helicopter was climbing to 60 feet above the water, the pilot failed to anticipate and correct for conditions, high gross weight, low indicated airspeed, and a right downwind turn, conducive to LTE, which resulted in LTE and uncontrolled spin. So there you go, folks. There's three examples um, of an LTE situation, one being a commercial pilot, and you know a couple other ones, uh, part 91 sightseeing. <laughs> There's three experiences, and they contribute some of this to this NTSB report. They're talking about the due to safety concerns, training for LTE is rarely done in an actual helicopter. Simulators allow pilots to practice recovery. However, the element of surprise and the rapid yaw that pilots may experience when the helicopter encounters LTE in flight is difficult to realistically achieve in some simulators. And, and there you go. How do you practice LTE? Now, when I when I teach students, we do do simulated LTE um, recovery. And basically all that is for me is I put the aircraft, I take control of the pedals, I put the aircraft into a right pedal spin per se, and I have the student uh, recover from it. Um, it's probably about as close as you're gonna get to the real life thing. Now I can say that after experiencing a tail rotor failure that the spin that I put the students in <laughs> is much slower than a, a real spin to the right. Um, but anyway, uh, LTE, it, it, you gotta be aware of it and that's one of the main things of being a helicopter pilot is you gotta be aware of your wind azimuths. That's probably be, between that and settling with power are probably my two biggest concerns when, when training. Uh, personal experience, and I think Kenny's gonna share one also, is um, training with a student in an R22. Um, it was a pretty pretty windy day that, that day. I think it was probably 15 knots, probably gusting to 18, 19. And uh, we were at the end of the, the training hour, uh, so we were kind of light on fuel. Um, but I was, you know, I'm 200 and some pounds and my other guy was 200 and some pounds. So the aircraft's still kind of heavy, even with light fuel. We're hovering taxiing up to the hangars. And right as we got close to the hangar, I think we hit uh, uh, one of those gusts coming up over the hangar and it hit us just right. And all of a sudden we're in a right, I think we're on the onset of LT. We didn't do, we didn't do a full revolution, but, uh, um, I was able to correct for it by flying out of it, but uh, I just remember the wind came over, we started spinning to the right, and my student actually said, help, and I took controls and I was able to fly out of it before we even came all the way around. But uh, it happened pretty quick, and, and like I said, it was a windy day, it was in the summer, so it's already hot out uh, for the high density altitude, and uh, you know, it can happen just that quick. 
Kenny, you got something? Yeah, I'll just share the, the, the picture I used for, for today to promote today's event was this helicopter that I used to fly, and this was during a boat race, and I thought this was good to show that, you know, here I'm low, I'm over the water, we're doing boat races, going real slow because the photographer, it was something for the clear channel, wanted to shoot the people along the shore, and you notice the wind sock, it looks like there's a little bit of tailwind behind me. That particular day, Flying boat races, you know, I flew to the like the limits of my ability, pushing this thing, chasing boats, and then putting yourself in slow positions like that. Anytime you're, you know, especially in the summertime, anytime you're hot, heavy, more fuel than normal, more people on board than normal, going out and putting yourself in situations like that. Um, the only, you know, I've had lots of times where I was with a student and thought that it was, you know, it started to go and I've always caught it. The only time I've experienced it in real life, I've always been able to avoid it, but in this exact same helicopter, um, one of the people I was flying with, one of the pilots, got into it above the city, out of ground effect hover, and we just flew out of it. But it happened quickly. When it started to spin, it happened way faster than what you would think. So I just want to throw that in there that uh, that picture makes me think of, you know, summertime, hot, heavy, uh, cam more camera equipment, you know, big camera rig on the other side, inside mounted, more weight than normal, and uh, that's what that makes me think of. And just to, um, I was gonna, just, since Gary's not here, I want to plug something else real quick. Oh, okay. Nobody's seen this. You guys all know we put out a remote pilot book. The brand new one came in, the new one, the new flat, whoops, the new uh, paperback. So there's a link down below. If you're interested, you can get it for 99 cents on Amazon. Sorry, Gary. That's what he gets. <laughs> so what he gets for gallon venting off around the yep. world, going on all these trips. All right, I should buzz over the other side and check comments. Go say check, uh, I think you had uh, at least one question or two maybe. Yep. It it's okay. This is where I really teach this and where it's really important, and this is what I go over with the students all the time is LTE, you want to know where that wind's coming from because what do we do as helicopter pilots when we show up to the ramp at an airport or wherever? We want fuel. So this is where I really talk about it is you're pulling up to the fuel pumps and you know, say you need gas on your left side, but the wind's coming from that side. You really don't want to spin out of control and hit the fuel pumps. And you don't want to spin out of control and hit a hangar or, or whatever. But so this is where you really got to think about where your wind azimuths are coming from when you're hovering around the, the airport ramp or, um, or any other obstacles really. So that was my training thought. I can come over there and join you for the last couple yeah. of questions. I'll just do it here on my phone. Yep. I wish I was running over there all the time. Um, from Max Flight Helicopter, a question for the end. In your experience, are some makes and models of helicopters more prone to experiencing LTE than others? That, I'm going to ask sure is an absolute yes. Yes. Depending on the aircraft you're flying, some are more susceptible. And what about Fenestron versus conventional terror designs? You know, I can't really say on that one. I mean, I, you know, it clearly tells us in the book it can happen to any single rotored helicopter. Mm -hmm. So the book says it can happen to anything. As far as Fenestron versus conventional, I don't know. I don't know enough about it to make you know, a, to make a quality. Uh, I don't either. A real qualified I mean, I have answer. Flown some Fenestrons. Um, now I have had someone tell me that. LTE is not um, a factor in finished drums, but I do not, I'm not saying that that's the truth, or I'm not saying... Well, I flew an EC-135 for two and a half years, and they never said, oh, you don't, you guys don't have to worry about LTE. They never right. said that. I would think wind azimuth is a wind azimuth, right? I mean, right. I they, they think... never, they, in two and a half years flying, so one, they, they never said, hey, don't worry about it, it doesn't happen to you. So there you go. So that would be my... I, I, I would say if you're in a counterclockwise rotating system with a, a single rotor mast, I would be concerned with it. Are NOTAR helicopters not affected by LTE? I would again say that they probably could be because the book tells us any... Then does it not say any single it rotor helicopter is susceptible? So that would be my answer to that one. I've never flown a NOTAR or I haven't had any training in one. So. I've never flown a NOTAR nor have I... Uh, asked anybody about that so I don't have any experience with that 
And then T. Gregory Berry has a question. I think this was for the uh, video we showed. Shouldn't the input of full left pedal been a red flag for the pilot and caused him to approach from a different angle? Anytime you have a lot of left pedal, it's it's telling you you got a problem. There's something going on. You should yeah. never have. You should know how much is in your normal reach. And if you're going more left pedal than normal, you know that you're starting to get into a situation. Would be my answer on that one. Um. Kind of touch base with that question along with the with the earlier question about um, different makes and models. Um, I have experience in a in an Instrum F twenty eight A model, and we were talking about this earlier. And I think it's two hundred and five horsepower, but I'm t but the tail rotor blade back there, I swear, is about two inches in width. If you go to an F model, it's about that wide. Right. But an A model is about that wide, and there's been times where we've got a lot of left pedal in there, and it's to the point almost where you're wondering. Yeah, I'm wondering if yep. if if one if there's not a uh, a rigging that needs to be, you know, maybe just uh, touched on, or maybe the rigging's just not right, or maybe that thing just can't handle. Maybe with that, you better not be any any type of left yep. winds that are above eight or 10 when you're hovering around or be so aware of that because there's, there's that thing takes a lot of left pedal. Yep. Paul says being in a hurry creates a problem. Being in a hurry always creates a helicopter or creates problems in a helicopter. Everything you should do be safe, slow, methodical. Out of the blue today, it just started doing that. I have no idea why. But yeah, anyway, that AC9095 <clears throat> talks about, you know, we never, you've always taught me and I and how I teach, you know, there's nothing fast about any of the maneuvers. Nothing. It's always nice, smooth, and, you know, and coordinated. So if you do a power increase real fast, you're going to have that power droop and, that, and it's just going to yep. make the problem worse. Uh... In my first solo flight, I had a problem with LT when I was coming in to set from to set the helicopter down. I was applying full left pedal and was fighting the machine to turn left. So I went, went with the helicopter and gained speed and better control and then set up into the wind to land. Sounds like you did the right thing. I mean, mm -hmm. if, if you're feeling like you're pushing too much, then you probably need to fly away. It's probably not going to get any better slowing down. Um, is the recovery for LTE and total tail rotor failure the same? Negative. This is, we, we did uh, one of our uh, live training Tuesdays in the past. It was one of our first ones. I actually looked for this today and I couldn't find it. And I don't know if we never edited it and put it back on YouTube or in the site, but our examiner asked us to make some videos and he said specifically here's the problem people are not understanding the difference between LTE and tail rotor failure stuck pedals and he said and this our examiner has been given check rides for 25 years or more and he said I'm just telling you what I see as an examiner continually applicants showing up and not being clear and he said it's a real problem it's a real problem people not understanding so we have a past live training tuesday where we kind of went over all the different ones and we touched on lte and we touched on those others and i'll have to dig around and figure out where that's at but that's why today we wanted to make it just lte specifically so yes there's a big difference between lte and a tail rotor failure the tail rotor is not failed in the lte there's nothing wrong with the tail rotor it's the pilots put himself in a bad position and didn't stay on top of the controls. Remember, LTE, you can <clears throat> recover. If you recognize it, you can recover from it. In a, in a tail rotor failure, remember, you've lost your thrust. Either the driver shaft broke, your tail rotor broke, the transmission seized, whatever. You've actually lost your thrust on that one. So, which, like I said earlier, we'll, we can do another live broadcast on that stuff. But, and then for stuck pedal, you still have the thrust back there, but you have no way of controlling the angle of the, the, the tail rotor. So that's something totally different. Um, LTE, you can correct. So. Yep. Um, Jessica asked, also to recover, it is suggested to apply forward cyclic. If in mountainous terrain or an area with this obstructions, one may also need to apply collective. So yeah, it depends on you, any given situation. Mm -hmm. You can fly out of it, but that's more of a, I'm not going to say an advanced maneuver, but well, it's going to be easier when you've had some experience and you've been able to kind of monkey with it, but 
somebody brand new I think is going to have a harder time flying out of it than any, somebody who's been flying a while. Well, and like you said, each situation is different. I mean, the book tells you the corrective action, full left pedal while pushing the cyclic forward right. to build your speed. That's Try what the book says. Fly out of it if you can. And if you have altitude, because LTE can actually happen at altitude, which I don't think really talked about but when you get up into the high gross weight and the high density altitude and uh, the thinner air you can actually um, and slow air speeds you can get into LTE and it talks about you may have to actually enter an auto or even lower the well, lower the collective and possibly enter an auto to get yourself out of it yes that's if altitude yep. permits and just like this most of the LTE situations are because you're hovering around so you may not be able to um, apply forward speed or get that forward speed straight ahead or, or whatever hopefully you can but yeah the one I mentioned earlier we were four or five hundred feet above the city downtown over you know doing out of ground effect, uh, hover for the news station doing video and we got into it all right my wife is an <laughs> RN and wants to train as a flight nurse what can passengers do to prepare if this happens nothing that I can think of I mean it's up to the pilot to avoid this at all possible and never get into it and to start with there's nothing really a passenger can do other than being strapped in the seat you know and properly strapped in like they should be is really the only thing that yeah and Becky says pray timing wise probably good 152 we like to keep these things in an hour so we're wrapping it up um, lots of good questions though Max Flight Helicopter, thanks guys. The rapid onset and the speed of the rotation is what can catch people out. Yes. It's, but it's about tech, it's good pilot technique from the start. And a lot of people, you know, they say, like I've had students that after they got their license, they go, I'm not doing all that crap Kenny makes me do. When you're maneuvering around the airport, going from here over to there, you know, I'm, stop, clear the tail, turn, stop, going slow. People think that's annoying. We do that on purpose. Mm -hmm. you know, that's why we're always moving the aircraft slowly near the ground. We're being careful to not get into LTE because you're gonna put the helicopter in those different winds. If you're on top of the controls and you're on top of the inputs and thinking about it, it's not gonna happen. You're gonna keep yourself out of it. It's just not being ready. I mean, is anyone else getting a video interruption with a still frame and about a camera? That's us. Yeah, we keep, we keep fixing that. This camera just did something weird today. I have no idea why it started this today. It's because we've just revamped the whole studio, changed <laughs> everything, and the camera I've been using for two and a half years decides to start, to start going goofy on us today. So that's just us. Um, we'll hopefully get that fixed for our next live event. Um, looks like that's about it. Effing annoying ideas. Uh, we'll work on it and try and get it fixed. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Gee, sorry. We're live. There's nothing we can do. I can't operate on the camera right now. And if Gary was here, we, we got another. Yeah, if Gary was here, this wouldn't yeah, be happening. Yeah, he could be standing next to the camera and hitting that button. <laughs> I have another brand new camera that we're trying to get set up, and we've revamped the whole thing. So if you guys can't handle a little, <laughs> a little freeze frame now and then, you know, hey, freeze frame. Is that it? I think that's it. So to basically wrap it up, LTE is uh, think about your wind azimuths when you're out there flying and you're um, hovering around. Um, I would really recommend you guys to read that AC 90-95 and it gets very detailed about, uh, about this, about LTE. And then uh, look stuff up in the Rotorcraft Flying Handbook or the Helicopter Handbook. Uh, it explains it in there too. But uh, like I said, um, when I train new pilots, my students, LTE and settling power, I hit those two concepts very hard. Those are the two, I think, the, one of the two biggest ones that will, that will kill you. So uh, welcome back. Hope everybody had great holidays. Um, Apparently, <laughs> apparently Gary's still celebrating the holidays, whatever. Um, have to come in here and take over for him. Uh, I think that's it. All right. Good seeing you guys. Thanks for joining us. Uh, and we'll see you next week. Kenny, you got anything? Nope. Just uh, a stupid shot here. My camera, all my cameras are flaking out on me today. I don't know what's going on. All those set perfectly earlier. Earlier. Anyway, live training Tuesday. Hogs.live. And I'm an idiot. Hogs.live.com. <laughs> that dot com should not be on there. It's hogs.live. That is the web address. So I just saw that. I wanted to point that out. To come back to sign up so that you get notifications or to come back any week. Hogs.live.com. 
and there's links below for all of our products and services down below. Oh yeah, helicopter check ride. You can get a free copy of my, a free PDF copy of my Amazon bestseller. First Amazon bestseller, helicopter check ride. Remote pilot's my second. Um, those links are down below to get a free copy. So we're gonna get out of here. Thanks everybody for commenting, being here, liking, subscribe to our channel, and we will see you in the next video.